All right, this is part three of our presentation called The Story of Josie. Questions to think about, first of all, however. What should we do when students make a miscue while reading orally? Why might asking students to sound out words they do not know be a silly thing to do? And what do our eyes do during the act of reading? Now, Josie was a third grade student in California with whom I worked online. I was tutoring her. Before our first session, I listened to her read passages at grade level 1.9. She read 50 words per minute with 97% accuracy. Seven weeks later, after 14 sessions, she read passages at grade level 2.5. Here she read 74 words per minute with 98% accuracy. Now to diagnose and assess, I didn't need no stinking tests. Instead, I listened to her read, noted the type of miscues she made, and watched her eyes. Watch the eyes of your readers. They tell you much, lots of good data. Noting what she was struggling with, we were able to focus our work specifically on two deficit areas, reading fluency and word identification. Now, a bit of a side, there are three reading deficit areas, word identification, fluency, and comprehension. Not all struggling readers struggle in all three areas. Many beginning readers struggle with word identification and fluency, often because they become over phoneticized. They've been over phonicsed, and they have not been taught other word identification strategies. And phonics has been used to stomp all the joy of reading right out of them. Initially, when Josie came to a word she didn't recognize, she stopped and began looking at individual letters. She was obviously using only a single cueing system, one third of her word recognition capacity. She began sounding out each individual letter. Letters and letter sounds soon filled up her short-term memory. She was trying to hold all the letters and sounds and put them together to create words and understand or remember what she read at the same time. Now remember, you can hold seven letters, seven words, or seven ideas. Which is more efficient for creating meaning? Ideas are, of course. That's why meaning-based approaches to reading instruction and interventions that focus on ideas and meaning are generally more effective than sounding out word interventions that focus on letters. And by the way, what do we usually do when children are reading out loud and they come to a word they don't recognize? We say, sound it out. Sound it out as if they hadn't thought of that. Of course, if they could sound it out, they wouldn't have stopped. So here's my super duper, super special, super secret reading strategy. I told Josie to say blank and keep moving on. There you go. I could call this the Johnson method. I could create specialized reading programs and charge teachers and tutors lots of money to take my classes they get all certified with the Johnson method. These Johnson teachers would be specially trained to tell students to say blank. They could even use multi-sensory say blank instruction to teach students to say blank. And oh, wouldn't that be grand because I would make lots of money off our struggling readers. And isn't that the way things are supposed to go? So I wanted Josie to start using the ideas in her head, as well as the clues around the target word to recognize it. It was quicker and easier than sounding out each individual letter. When she did this, when she said blank, she always figured out the word by the end of the sentence, usually two or three words down the line. 
So instead of 10 seconds and lots of frustration, it took one or two seconds to figure out the word. So think about it. 10 seconds in frustration, one or two seconds, no frustration. Which do you think might be better for creating meaning with print? A few weeks later, she told me I was magic because the words just popped into her head. Magic. I taught her to say blank and let her eyeballs bounce around on both sides of the word. We also did a lot of clothes and maze activities where I taught her to use clues on both sides of the target word to figure it out. We did a lot of clothes and maze practice. That's magic. This is what I would do. Remember, if you see a wor word you don't know, say blank and skip it. Let your eyes look for clues. The elf blank and hit its head. Hmm, what are some clues, I'd say. What, what is your guess? Hmm, here's another one. What is your guess? And we would do these. We'd use clothes and maze activities. These are very blank garden pots. Hmm, hmm. Yes, only one of them makes sense. Only one of them makes sense. We would do, I would say, six to eight of these. It would take us four to six minutes at the most as we develop the semantic cueing system. And here's another thing. When listening to students read orally, this is hard to do, but stop correcting them. Just stop it for three reasons. If you correct them, it deprives them of the, of the ability to develop metacognition. This means thinking about thinking. Does the sentence make sense? Is this the right word? Second, it deprives them of the chance to develop the semantic and syntactic cueing system if you jump right in and correct their mistakes. And third, students associate good reading with word accuracy. There's a hesitancy to make mistakes. This hesitancy to make mistakes results in the slow, choppy, word-by-word -word reading. So let's take a look at eye movement and miscue analysis. Eye movement research tells us much about reading and the reading process. This research looks at eye movement as people are engaged in authentic reading activities. That means they're reading passages versus individual words. And here you see the eye movement types of uh, uh, software. Eye movement research shows us that our eyeballs don't move in a nice straight orderly line from left to right. Our brain just tricks us into thinking it so. So a few important terms. First, saccades are the skips the eyeballs make as they leap from word to word and over words. About 40% of the time, we skip right over words. Fixations are where our eyeballs stop. And the thing about fixations is we only see clearly that upon which our eyeballs fixate. And I'll show you that in a minute and regressions are the backward movements while reading. Going back to recheck a word or phrase is called a regression. We do this more often with complex expository texts than less complex. So we don't move in a nice straight orderly line. It's more like a hummingbird flittering about. When we read text, our eyeballs do not move in a straight line across the page. They make skips from word to word. This little dot is where an example of where the eyeball stop, and you could see the regression. Boop. Now, perceptual regions. We have three of them, foveal, parafoveal, and peripheral. The foveal comprises only 1% to 2% of our total vision. It's the only visual region in which we can see clearly, and you see it right there. It's about the size of a grape at arm's length. We see only six to eight letters clearly using normal size text. The parafoveal extends about 15 letters outside the foveal, or out to about 24 letters from the point of fixation. 
Here we can perceive things, but not very clearly. This is like the line at the optometrist that you had to stop because you couldn't make out any more letters. And the peripheral region is everything else, and this is very fuzzy. Now, here's the thing about fixations. We can only see clearly what we fixate on. So what we think of as reality is, in a sense, a series of snapshots played back to back like a movie reel in our head. Our eyes are constantly moving about as we look at things. Our eyeballs don't stay still. They flitter about like hummingbirds, taking little snapshots as your brain fills in the blanks. More on that. But when we see this, our eyeballs go like this, taking in little pictures, and it fills in the blanks. Even when you think you're, uh, you're staring straight ahead, your eyeballs are dancing around. Next time you're driving down the road in your car, on a freeway, you think you're looking straight ahead, notice that your eyeballs are actually dancing about. Here's an experiment. As you stare right at this letter, all these letters in the peripheral began to fade in the peripheral. Now, as we let our eyeballs, oh yes, they become clear. So what we see of reality really is our eyes flittering about taking little snapshots. When we read, our eyeballs fixate on only 60% of the words. This means we skip right over 40% of the words. So clearly, what's in our head is directly in our eyeballs as we read. We skip more function words. That's like and, the, in. They serve a grammatical function. We skip fewer content words, information words. So the question is this. With the very small in-focus viewing area, how are our brains able to read more than 10 words per minute? How is that possible? Again, the reader uses minimal letter clues. The brain fills in the blanks. The brain uses syntax and semantics to predict. And the brain is a meaning-making machine looking to create order out of chaos not a sounding out word machine. Here we get the foveal, the fixation. Six letters, four to six letters are seen. There you go. You get the idea of the foveal, parafoveal, and peripheral. In order for our brains to operate efficiently, it takes in the salient element and fills in the blanks. During the act of reading, readers gain information from the parafoveal to micro-predict what the next word might be. There you go. This is done by using context, semantics, and syntax. And our eye movement research shows that readers are able to identify words microseconds before the eyeballs actually hit it. So let's take a look at some research. Eric Paulson's 2002 eye movement study. Eric Paulson did some research looking at reading miscues and eye movements. He was particularly interested in the words readers omitted or substituted. I mentioned two types of miscues earlier. There's actually four, meaning disrupting miscues disrupts the meaning. Doesn't make sense. Yep. Meaning maintaining, the word fits within the sentence. It makes sense. There are two others, grammatically correct, but meaning disrupting miscues. The word makes no sense in the sentence, but it is grammatically correct. The monkey run a banana versus monkey, the monkey ate a banana. Both are verbs. So this indicates that the syntactic, the syntactic cueing system is at work here. And then self-corrections. The reader makes a miscue, pauses to check if that miscue makes sense, and then goes back and corrects. This is an example of metacognition, a mature reading behavior. And this shows that the semantic cueing system is working. Now, Paulson found some interesting stuff. He found that readers are likely to visually examine, to fixate 
miscued words. Even though they stopped and looked right at the word or fixated for ample duration, they often omitted these words or substituted these words or changed these words. These omissions, substitutions, and changes were still meaning maintaining. That means the sentence still made sense. The old man was walking down the road. Omitted very, even though the reader fixated right on it, but it still made sense. Remember, we perceive only that which our eyeballs fixate on. Another example, a substitution. The big black dog liked to lay on the bed. It's sleep, the reader fixated right on there but still said lay instead of sleep. Most words that were skipped in his study that were not fixated on were read without miscues. Again, remember, we don't actually perceive visual stimuli unless we fix on it, fixate on it. So even though they were skipped, most words that were skipped were read without miscues. So what can we take from this? First, eye movement reflects a meaning-making process, not a sounding out word process. Eye movement shows that the brain is using the text to confirm the micro-predictions. They're saying, does this make sense? And the second thing, readers don't look at every letter or word. They use syntactic and semantic information, as well as information in the head to recognize words. And efficient readers do what's necessary and most efficient to make sense of text, to create meaning. And this means that they engage in all three queuing systems. They engage all three queuing systems to create meaning with print. So a big idea that we can take from this, effective reading instruction should reinforce the way the brain creates meaning with print. That means we need to have activities that develop the semantic, syntactic, and phonological cueing systems.